is Dennis McQuestion. I'm the uh, CEO and president of the National Center for Policy Analysis. We are a Dallas, Texas-based think tank, unlike many of the think tanks that are located here. We do have a great Washington presence. You'll meet one of the people here in a minute, but Brian is sitting back here. Brian, most of you know Brian Williams, I hope, uh, is our legislative assistant here. And we are pleased to bring you some uh, very current information on a subject that is obviously very important to all of you, and that has to do with health care spending and the Affordable Care Act. Now, the good news is there's been nothing in the newspaper about the Affordable Care Act for the last uh, two or three hours. Would that be <laughs> fair to say, uh, given what happened yesterday? I was in the, um, a meeting this morning, and, and one person was giving a presentation on this. They had been involved in one of, in fact, in both decisions that came down yesterday in the courts. And they said they were checking with the Guinness Book of World Records to see if this is the quickest that two court decisions have been issued diametrically opposed from each other in history. So it could be that that's the case. I don't know if they'll uh, get into that today or not. We'll see. But to lead this discussion and to give you a presentation uh, to start with, I think we're going to start with Andy Rittenmeyer. Is that right? Andy's going to start. He's the Executive Associate Director of the Private Enterprise Research Center. His boss is sitting next to him, Tom Saving, that many of you know. He's the Director of the Private Enterprise Research Center. He's Professor of Economics at Texas A&M University. He's a former public trustee of the Social Security and Medicare uh, Administration, or systems, I should say. He's an NCPA senior fellow, and he was also on the 2001 Presidential Commission to Strengthen Social Security. So Tom Savings has been there and done that, and I'm not sure if he just looks my age because he's taught for a long time or whatever, but I would suspect he's at least Social Security age, which is something that not many of you will recognize, but he and I will be uh, very much important to us, you understand. And finally, last but not least, will be John Graham. He's a senior fellow at the National Center for Policy Analysis. He's located here in Washington, and as I think he'll tell you later, if you have questions, follow up about this, these guys get to go home to Bryan College Station John gets to stay here and he will be available to you today or in the future about any questions that you want to ask about health care policy. So I'll ask you to uh, put them together first for Andy Rittenmeyer. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, just visit with you guys about um, some topics that Tom and I have been thinking about for quite a long time. Uh, Tom's experience as a public trustee of Medicare and Social Security. There were um, many a times we would uh, just think about all the uh, things that go into the uh, trustees' reports uh, related to Medicare in particular. And so we've always been interested here in, in thinking about health care spending in general, uh, not just the health care spending in particular to the uh, Medicare, uh, the one that we really have spent most of our time on. Um, but back in September, we started thinking about um, uh, a couple of topics related to the healthcare sector, something, you know, some of the things that really make healthcare quite unique uh, among other industries. And those are some of the things that we're uh, going to visit with you today about. Um, the, um, as as you, all of you guys are probably aware, there's been this uh, uh, very important recent uh, uh, question about has healthcare spending uh, uh, been declining? Has the growth rate in healthcare spending declined? And when we think about that, do we think about it in terms of uh, spending relative to something else or just spending in general? And when we think about it, we all, you know, we're thinking about a per capita kind of uh, number. How fast has per capita healthcare spending been growing? Um, so, the things that we see uh, that have, has received lots of commentary is this graph, okay? Uh, I'll refer to this graph uh, and, and this will help uh, frame some of our discussion. So each, each year the uh, actuaries at uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services produce the uh, national uh, health expenditure accounts and this graph is one that you're probably pretty familiar with. Um, you can see that uh, this graph is a depiction of national health care expenditures as a percent of GDP. Um, uh, the things that are kind of uh, obvious in the graph are that 
it, it's going up. The share is going up. But <clears throat> there are a couple of periods that are, are imp that are interesting in and of themselves in that um, between 93 and 2000, we had this period when healthcare spending as a share of GDP stayed static at about 13.4% during that entire period. Um, another period like that was between 2003 and 2006. Uh, again, relatively stable period. And then this recent period that we're getting a, a lot of press about. When this, uh, when this was released in January, there was a lot of commentary about, well, why is healthcare spending as a share of GDP declining? I mean, this is a uh, uh, pretty interesting phenomenon. And is it related to the Affordable Care Act? Um, what, what I want to really, one of the take homes I want you guys to have from this particular graph is that Sure enough, it is declining as a share of GDP, 14, uh, from 17.4 to 17.2 percent from 2009 to 2012. But I want you to also see that there are two other periods quite like this, okay? Now, when we think uh, again about this healthcare spending as a percent of GDP, we might think, well, you know, we've got healthcare spending in the numerator, we've got GDP in the denominator. That's how we get this ratio. And when we see these flat periods, we know that the relative growth rates are pretty similar. And so let's take a look at that. Um, what I want to introduce here is um, some computations that are based on the national income and product counts that help us update the series that you saw in the previous graph. The previous graph uh, ends in 2012. Okay. It's, it's uh, released in January of 2014. And so by the time it's released next year, we'll have an update up to 2013. So January 2015, we'll know what happened in 2013. But things happened between uh, 2012 and 2013, and, and we already have a quarter of information from this year. And so I'd, what I'd like to do is just introduce an alternative measure that's different than the one that the uh, CMS actuaries do, but is comparable. And that's, that's what I want this next graph to illustrate. You can go to the national income and product accounts and produce a graph, a series, that's quite similar to the one produced by CMS. That's the one in red, okay? So the bottom one is one that we put together, just going straight to the national income and product accounts. Um, this is really uh, just a follow-up on some work that was uh, done by um, uh, uh, two folks at the CMS and one at the BEA who did somewhat of a reconciliation of the accounting. And I'm just following up on it. We're just following up on their methodology and using their, the, the tables from the national income and project accounts and updating those. And what we are able to do with that is we're able to update the series up to 2013 and kind of have a preview for next year. Okay, so that last point is a preview for next year. Um, and you can see that uh, based on our estimates. And we had to, I'll, I'll make one caveat. There's one, um, to, to make this forecast, um, uh, these data are available on a quarterly basis, except for a couple of series based on government uh, investment expenditures. Those I have to estimate, and I just hold those as uh, fixed as a share of GDP and let them grow with GDP to make my estimates here. But this is a ballpark estimate of a, a series that, as you can see, is quite similar over time. Um, the point is, is that it, we're looking at maybe another year of relatively stable share of GDP um, that is comprised of healthcare spending. Um, and we're looking at something like 17.4. Um, so that would be a preview of what might be released come January of next year. But the other thing about the data, given that it's available on a quarterly basis, let's uh, take a look at a little uh, more frequency in the observations. And that's here. And what this is, is now we denominate both series by the number of uh, uh, folks. So we get it on a, a, a per capita basis. So this is divided by population. And then we look at, we, we uh, deflate it by the GDP deflator, both series. So both series are in real terms. And these are real growth rates, 
okay? And you might think, well, what, what, do, what do you want to take away from this? Well, this is a long time series, okay? You can go back to 1960 and look at all these different business cycles. The business cycles are in gray. And you can see just what you'd expect to see with per capita GDP. You can see the red lines go down each time. You can see this dramatic decline uh, associated with the last recession, the great, uh, which is known as the Great Recession by many. And you can also see what goes on with healthcare spending. Now, <clears throat> the thing that I want you to see there is that the healthcare spending, when it does decline, it declines less dramatically in terms of its growth rate than uh, GDP. Um, and that um, really what you're after with this graph is to, uh, uh, to see just the, how the two series are correlated and then some periods in which they're not, okay? Um, and when we do forecasts of uh, future healthcare spending, um, it often relies on a concept that you guys are probably all aware of, this, this idea of excess cost growth. And excess cost growth is, is you know, in, in the simplest term, is just the difference between per capita GDP growth and per capita healthcare spending growth. So healthcare spending growth, less uh, uh, GDP growth on a per capita basis. And it doesn't mean that, the, that uh, healthcare spending is excessively high. It just means that there's, there's this different, di difference between the two. And oftentimes when you see the forecast of future healthcare spending, it's all driven by GDP growth and then how much faster will healthcare spending grow relative to GDP, okay? So it's the difference between the two and you say, well, let's see what that trend looks like. And this drives the, the, the forecast by uh, CMS for uh, uh, Medicare it drives the forecast for uh, by the CBO, which just re released their long-term budget outlook last uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks, and uh, you'll see that that uh, you'll see in the press there's a discussion of how rapidly the excess cost growth has been declining, and let's take a look at that. So I'm going to take these two series and basically take the difference between the two. Okay. And do one more thing. I'm going to average over 10 years, okay? So that we get rid of some of the noise from the previous series, and now we're going to take and look at the real per capita growth rate in GDP and real per capita growth rate in healthcare spending. And this is a trailing 10-year average, so it's just what, what is the average over the last 10 years, okay? You can see the blue line is the one for healthcare spending, and that's so we see. Well, yeah, over over averaging this this series over a long horizon, you can see this this decline. Okay, it's declining over time, and that's um, uh, good news if uh, you're concerned about uh, how rapidly it might be growing relative to GDP and how rapidly uh, it, it may be, uh, the, its share GB, GDP is uh, accelerating. But the red line also tells us another story that says, look, the, the per capita GDP growth for a long time was quite stable. I mean, there's variations around the theme there, but you can see what's happened in this recent period. It's, it's quite low. Um, so even though healthcare spending, uh, uh, real per capita health, care spending is declining, it's going on at the same time that we have this, this uh, declining real GDP. Okay, so now we'll take this, the difference between these two, and that will be our 10-year um, average excess cost growth. Um, let me make a, uh, first a, a, a caveat about this. This is just the raw difference. When, uh, when the CBO does this, um, they take out uh, in the when we think about healthcare spending, they take about out things like age and gender effects. That as the population age structure is changing, they take out those effects. And also, when they think about the the per capita GDP growth, they're looking at potential GDP. This is just raw health healthcare spending growth 
raw GDP growth in real terms. And the difference is what you see here. Again, averaged over a long horizon, okay? So what's the takeaway from this one? Okay, the, the takeaway again is that excess cost growth has declined generally over time. And you can, uh, you can imagine a line going through that, uh, where that might terminate, where, where, where it might show up to be around GDP plus zero. Um, but right now, based on these most recent estimates that update all the way to the first quarter, um, we have uh, an estimate of excess cost growth of about 1.4%. Um, to, to just put that in context, the CBO um, in their last long-term budget outlook is using 1.4 as their baseline long-run estimate. Now, that estimate is average. They get 1.4 from the way I described how they calculate excess cost growth, and that's the average from 1985 to 2012. This is just the 10-year average that we have here. But nonetheless, it's right in that same ballpark of about 1.4%. That's the story on the excess cost growth. Where does that leave us? You know, you, you can say, well, we can imagine a line through that, and we can say we can track that through time, and that... It, it looks like it's going to decline relative to 1.4, and it may reach GDP plus zero at some future date. And, you know, to tell you the truth, that's often how we do the long-run forecast with a CMS and or the CBO, is that gradually these things approach some long-run assumed growth rate. CBOs is around GDP plus one. Uh, CMS, in their 2013 trustees report, it was... GDP plus zero at the very end, uh, at the end of 75 years. So um, that is, that's just kind of the, the background that says, yeah, excess uh, cost growth has been declining. Um, where it goes from here, we can see that there's a, a recent uptick. Um, and that, again, is based on our most recent estimates that go through the first quarter of 2014. So, <laughs> Now, the, the, the next thing I want you to take a look at is uh, the health sector employment. And this is where uh, some of the things we did uh, 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 last fall, uh, these are some of the things that we were thinking about then. And uh, you can take a look at all of those series. Each, each series represents a different industry, okay? And again, uh, this, this goes from 1990 to the present. Uh, the most recent, the most recent two estimates are May and June. Those are provisional uh, uh, employment estimates. But nonetheless, what you, the the things that we should see here is that just as you'd expect in a in a business cycle in a recession, the gray bars, you see the sector sectoral declines, and you can see it's particularly pronounced during this last recession. Now. The one I want you to focus on is find healthcare in there. It's the third one up from the bottom, okay? And look at that, it's the darkest blue line, okay? And you can see that it's quite different than all the other series. It doesn't go up and down during the business cycle. It just uh, grows uh, almost at a continuous uh, growth rate. Um, and um, even during this last business cycle, uh, it was, it grew. In contrast, during the last business cycle, uh, from the peak to the trough of the Great Recession, um, total non-farm employment dropped 5.4%. Uh, uh, construction dropped 19.8%. Uh, you can see that on this, in this figure. You can see the relative size of this. Manufacturing dropped 147 uh, The healthcare sector, in contrast, grew 33 Okay, this is during the Great Recession. And these are during the time period during which um, the ACA was uh, uh, passed soon after this. Okay? Um, just to, to, to give you some uh, firmer numbers, these, these figures just show the, just are bar graphs of the first decade, the second decade, and then the entire time period, where the blue bar, the dark blue bar, again, is the healthcare sector. And you can see that um, in the first uh, decade that we cover, uh, the only one that uh, really is above it is uh, business, professional business services. During the next 10 years, um, 
you can see that while all the others dropped uh, pretty uh, dramatically relative to what they had been, the healthcare sector was still marching on. And then over the entire time period, the only sector that approaches the same growth rate is the um, professional and business services. Um, but as we saw, it doesn't. The, the the healthcare sector was a continuous growth rate during this time period. The the other sector, this uh, uh, business services, was one that went up and down with the business cycle, like most of the other industries. So. Uh, just the takeaways from the first part of the presentation, then I'll turn it over to Tom. Um, the recent period of stable healthcare spending as a share of GDP is one of, of you know, three others. It's one of three similar other periods. Um, <clears throat> there's been a long run decline in the, uh, the excess cost growth rate, but we see a recent uptick. Um, over the last 10 years, the excess cost growth rate has been about 1.4%. Um, and then the healthcare sector employment, like I said, is, is, has grown uh, rather continuously through this entire time period uh, that we covered. And uh, it's in, in contrast to the other, other industries. And all of this will give us a little um, uh, thought about how to think about uh, how healthcare spending will grow in the future. Yeah, I, I, I remember you know, the fighting with the trustees, and, and Andy brought up this notion of what, where are we headed, and uh, are we headed to, as CBO would say, we're heading to uh, GDP growth plus one, or as the trustees would say, we're headed to GDP plus zero. I remember when we first had this big debate, I was a trustee about how we were going to change the way we did things, and at, at, at that point we decided that what we were going to, uh, uh, I was opposed to this, but I didn't win that one. I won most of them, especially in the way we presented the report. Uh, but in this case, I didn't win, and they said we're going to we're going to let things be at the end. We're going to be at GDP plus zero. The first thing the actuaries try to tell me is that healthcare can't grow forever faster than GDP because otherwise it would be everything. And I had to point out the mathematics that was wrong. That's simply wrong. It can always grow faster than GDP as long as everything else also grows. It, it'll grow slower than GDP, but that's okay. And that. You'd think the mathematicians would understand that, but I do a lot of math for them to help them understand it. And when we did this GDP plus zero, and after we had done that and recalculated uh, unfunded liabilities, it did it in the way that we wouldn't change the unfunded liability of HI, which was kind of important there. And what we were doing, how were we going to present this? And someone said, well, we ought to present the fact that everything looks better at the end. And I said, well, we can't do that. We made that up. <laughs> there isn't anything that happened that says it's going to be lower. We just made it up. And to point that out, I think, would be silly to tell people, we made it up that it's going to be lower and you should all feel better. No, we can't do that. So we didn't. And I think it was, it was good that we didn't. Uh, here we have, uh, this thing works, I assume. Uh, healthcare market sector performance. What, what I really want to talk about is, what does the healthcare sector think about this? You know, about the Affordable Care Act. Well, we know the healthcare sector was were the big proponents of the, of the Affordable Care Act. And you'd say, if you looked at the original uh, alternate report, which I'll talk about in a little while from CMS, you would wonder why that was true. In fact, you would wonder why the imposition of of both the sustainable growth rate stuff on physicians and the productivity adjustment that was in the Affordable Care Act, which was going to reduce the payments to providers forever, why the healthcare sector would think this is a good idea. Uh, and I think they were looking at it from a demand side, but that's really what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, let's get to, what's the market think? So we've got two things Andy's already talked about. What's the sector? It's expanding like crazy. And everything about the, the Affordable Care Act says, one of the, what were the two big things that, that it was about? One of them is, somehow we've got to get more people consuming more health care. And we got the uninsured, we're worried about them, they're not getting care. And hospitals thought they were getting care because they, the, the, they were eating the resources they were consuming. But, but let's imagine, that's what we want to do. We want to increase the demand for health care. Now, we also want to reduce 
the amount we're spending on it. Well, how do we do that? How does that work? We're going to have more demand, and how do we make total expenditure smaller? Prices have got to get lower. And they have to get lower by more than we've increased demand. How is that going to work? Well, it works in the typical way that this is usually done. We say we're just going to make sure we're just going to fix prices as lower. And we've seen that recently in Venezuela where the president says they have all this inflation. Prices are too high. We're going to make all the prices lower. And the only problem with that is there's nothing on the shelves. <laughs> And that's an issue that we might, I'll, I'll come to in a moment. But anyway, here's what the market's telling us. Healthcare is going up versus everything else in the S&P much faster, S&P 500. Here are the total monthly returns in three sort of significant periods. Uh, one of them up to 2009 where, uh, where it's doing better. But you also have the period uh, uh, from the, uh, the estimates from 2009 to now, then you have when uh, when you had the the first when when the a, a Affordable Care Act was signed, suddenly if it was going to have all these bad effects, market didn't think so. They thought it was going to be good, and then once the decision, the whole big Supreme Court decision came along, the healthcare sector jumped even more. Uh, something says the mar the the industry thinks this is going to be a boom. Uh, and I think that, 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 that's important uh, So we, in terms of what they think. That doesn't mean that's going to happen, you know, but coming back. And let's take a look at, uh, at what these forecasts have looked like. And I wanna, I'm going to separate them out in a way to make, let you see what's going on. Because the very top line is, the, the, the second from the top line, is... Uh, the, the CMS estimates in 2009, before the Affordable Care Act. And uh, the dark line is their baseline estimate, which is what, and then we also had an alternate estimate, and the reason we had that alternate estimate was a big fight with the trustees, because we were assuming uh, you, have to, you're, you have to pretend that, that the current law is gonna work, at least for 10 years. And then after that, we could deviate from it and say, current law is silly, it can't, last so we'll say what we think is real and uh, and that that's that's what the baseline was based on then and at that point the big thing about current laws was sustainable growth rate physician payments and so if you looked at the, that 2009 it would have been assuming that in 2019 physicians would have been paid being paid about 45 percent of what they were currently being paid and even though the 10 years before that, Congress has never let that happen. And so you, but if you assume, then the alternate would say, no, that's not going to happen. All Congress is going to continue to do what they've done for the last decade. They're going to re change, they're going to rescind the SGR each year. Now, we've talked about permanent doc fix, but that yet hasn't happened. But each year they would do a doc fix. And so that's what the, the little line is just a little bit above the other one. You know, not much difference because that was the only difference. Now suddenly you've got a new current law. And the new current law says that not only are we going is SGR gonna work, but we're going to have a productivity adjustment and suddenly healthcare is gonna be rise in productivity as fast as general productivity. Something's never ever happened in the past, but started magic and that year it's gonna happen. And that's where all the bottom lines, they all look alike. Those are all the trustees' reports subsequent to the passage of the Affordable Care Act. They all look alike. But the other law, so the alternates, and now I want to do this separately. This is, here's the 2009 and the alternate. Not very much different, only different because of this idea of the sustainable growth rate that, was, that had been rescinded. So there what we did in the alternate was say that wouldn't, wasn't going to happen. Now we get to the to the uh, to the, tech, the next year, the 2010, you have a huge fall in the baseline because the baseline's now based. And not only did they do their current law, but they let current law go forever. Now, when CBO does this, they only allow current law to go for a decade, and then they do what they want to do. In this case, the trustees allowed current law to go forever, which is basically healthcare growth at CDC, GDP plus zero, at least on a per capita basis. And as you can see, the alternate was much, much bigger than the baseline. That's the first time it's, because it's, it's gotta be bigger because you're gonna say, hey, S, these 
SDR things we've done for the last 10 years, that's not going to happen. These productivity adjustments aren't going to happen because if they do, hospitals are going to be bankrupt. And hospitals that don't make money, they close down. And so this isn't going to happen. It'll be like Venezuela with nothing on the shelf. That's not going to happen. Now, as you'll see, the next year, what, what happens is the baseline looks the same, but what happens to the alternate? Well, we're getting a little rosier with the alternate. And so each year, watch what happens. The alternate gets better and better and better. <laughs> we're looking better and better and better. Uh, now, is there any real thing that's going on here? Uh, well, uh, at least in these other years, if you know something about the alternate, is that it is always above the baseline, except for last year's trustees report, where in last year's trustees report, they, again, imposed the current law thing even on the alternate, uh, and then they let the alternate go differently. Now, the real question is, what's this next one going to look like that's going to come out on Friday? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. It's not being a trustee. If I were a trustee, I couldn't tell you anyway. But, <laughs> but anyway, what is it going to look like? Are, uh, is the general accounting office's little statement last year that that the, what uh, what the trustees are doing we they can't sign off on because it doesn't make any real sense and it, is that why the trustees report is late i don't know is it going to look very different is the alternate going to look a lot different than the baseline recognizing that gao thinks that what what they're doing doesn't doesn't make sense we i don't know the answer to that just to give you a feel for how these alternates have declined, what I have is you, in 2009, there was very little difference. And as I told you, the only difference has to do with SGR and the recognition that Congress isn't going to stop paying physicians because physicians won't show up for work. It's not going to happen. Uh, and, uh, and the alternates were much different. And then, as you can see, the alternates have just approached the baseline as we've gone along. And I think that uh, I don't know why we're imagining that the world can be better in this simple way. And there's a real caution here about this because you, know, you look at what CBO is doing. And as, as Andy's thing pointed out, you, know, you, you have long periods of, uh, and, uh, of excess cost growth. And now you have, any, you have two years where an excess cost growth was negative. Now, remember, the way they calculated, of course, is on potential GDP. And I don't know how many years you think that actual GDP has been at potential GDP. It's been a long time. <laughs> and in fact, CBO is revising downward potential GDP. But it's still above actual GDP. Hasn't gotten to actual yet. And, or actual hasn't gotten to potential, even though they're making potential fall. So it's very dangerous, you know, the first year when you start, even when CBO is doing it, and they're starting with a negative cost growth and approaching in the long run, their kind of long run uh, excess cost growth. It's dangerous to take a few years, good years, when you had 25 years of bad years in a row. And we have a good kind of thing I'll just put up here just to give you a feel for what this is like. This, this, is, this is something that CBO did in, in 2000 and 2001. And when we had three years of consecutive budget surpluses, 25 years before that were all deficits. What did CBO do? They said, well, from now on, we're at budget surpluses forever. So there's their, there's their forecast based on that idea that the last observation was good, so the future is always going to be better. They did that, and you can see their their forecast of the publicly held federal debt starting at forty percent. They were looking at five percent at the end of a decade. Of course, it's sixty five percent at the end of a decade, and we know a lot of things happen. But what what do we know about the world is that if something something unusual happens this year, it probably is not going to happen next year. And if it happens two years in a row, it's still probably not going to happen. If it's coming 25 years or something else, there's an equilibrium in the world, and, we're, and, if, and if something has really happened to change it, it's not changing. Uh, and this is the, the issue that's coming up with, in fact, with this last bill, and I want to get to the point. I've got five minutes. I want to talk about a little bit more about this. But what's going on here is the, the, uh, the public's stake in the healthcare game 
has been falling, and it's been falling for 60 years, 50 years, 50 years it's been falling. Our stake in the game is falling, and healthcare expenditures are rising. Now, I don't mean our stake in the game. We've got to be careful about what we mean by that. I mean our personal stake in the game. Because remember, we're taxpayers, and we're, <laughs> and we're paying. So to pretend that the public's only paying, what we mean is directly out of our pocket. We're paying somebody else. And, and then we're tax, taxpayers, we're all paying. And it's, we have to be very careful about that when we talk about these things. And, I, uh, and the reason, and let's see, I think that my conclusions are this recent period of stable healthcare spending, just like several other periods in the past, uh, long run excess cost growth is rising again. Uh, uh, excess cost growth over the last 10 years is 1.4% above GDP. Uh, and remember, it can stay above GDP forever as long as everything else grows. That can happen. Uh, but the healthcare sector thinks this is this Affordable Care Act is going to be a boom. Why do they like it? The hospitals like it because they're going to get paid, and that's all they cared about. They want they want, one of their biggest problems are bad debts. You get to any hospital administrator and you discover what's the big issue they have. It's bad debts. Affordable Care Act was going to make sure everybody was going to insure. So all of us in here would be paying every time they came into the hospital. And that's what they cared about. Um, and they weren't concerned that the way the bill was written, they weren't going to get paid. And they didn't believe that. Uh, and the stock market performance indicates the stock market doesn't believe it. We, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and by favorable treatment, the industry doesn't think the healthcare sector is going to get smaller. They're expanding. They think it's going to get bigger. And, uh, and I think, but what does that mean? It means that if we were in Venezuela, again, where there's nothing on the shelves, and I was speaking to a congressman yesterday, uh, our local congressman, and, and just in bringing up the fact that we're here, and I said, and I said, and he said, but, but the bill says we're going to reduce these payments. And I said, no, this isn't Venezuela. The president of Venezuela might be willing to let the shelves be empty at the grocery store. So you have to buy your toilet paper in the black market. Our Congress isn't going to let that happen. We are not going to let the shelves at the health care sector be empty. It's not going to happen. And that's what the sector thinks anyway. The sector thinks that. I don't know what's really going to happen, but I can't believe that we would allow what's going on in Venezuela to happen here in the healthcare sector. And if we don't, that means healthcare expenditures are going to keep rising and the Affordable Care Act isn't going to stop it. I mean, we've got these. Uh, doesn't mean it's, 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 their, it's the Affordable Care Act's fault. No, <laughs> it's, not, it's not that fault. Uh, anything that reduces our stake in the game is going to make healthcare grow, grow faster. Uh, but otherwise, and you know, in a person like uh, when, when, you, when you have old people, <laughs> another old person right there, you know, we need to replace body parts. Come on, guys. And I remember I, when I was giving a speech, and this is the last thing I'll say, is I, I, I'm talking about uh, Medicare reform, something I've been involved in 20 years or so. And there was a, a, a woman in the audience, and she was up, and she was talking about saying, you know, I have all these prescriptions I have to take. Somebody has to pay for them. And, uh, and I don't want to mean that I don't want to be mean to people, but I, want, but I, but I asked her, I said, well, just let, let me tell you, look, stand up, point to the person in this room who should pay for your pharmaceuticals. Point to that person and say, I'm going to take away your money for your children to pay for my stuff. Who is that person? Well, if it's nobody, which is the way we're doing it now, then you don't have to worry about that. Nobody's paying. We're all paying, but no one in particular is paying. And it makes it much harder when you appoint the person who should have to pay. And this is all about the industry only cares about getting paid. And that's what it's all about. And that's, uh, and, uh, to, and we have this conflicting thing with the Affordable Care Act. I don't know where we're, where we're headed, but I suspect that the industry is right, as I told our congressman. You guys are not going to let the health care shelves be empty. And if you're not, you're going to have to, just as you've done with 
uh, SGR on physicians, you're going to do the same thing with uh, with these productivity adjustments, and you're never going to. And every time we bring up the idea that the uh, that the IPAB is going to say what kind of things we're going to cover, then we know what happens to them in the press. They become the death panel. That's not happening either. And if we don't let those things happen, the healthcare sector is going to keep growing. And, and maybe there are ways around it. I've suggested lots of them. I'm not here to talk about those. But that I think that gives you a summary of, I think, where, where this is headed. It'll be interesting to see. And, and the court cases today, uh, the first one had maybe something to do with whether or not uh, you know, the amount of un uh, uninsured who will now be insured and would consume more health care. But the issues we have are, are, are simple. The thing that we're doing, even in our local, at, because we're a university, we're, we're, we're self-insured. So we come up with this idea that we have to have a wellness check. Now, if there's one thing that all physicians would agree that's a total waste of money, it's a wellness check. From the, from the perspective of everybody having to pay for it. In the same way that two years ago they suggested that mammograms, you know, most of them were unnecessary. Therefore, we should do them less often. Remember what happened there, of course. <laughs> and as I like to tell them, unnecessary things aren't, un, aren't, aren't valueless. A, a, a clear mammogram is of value to the person who got the result. And they might be willing to pay for it. So it isn't unnecessary just because it came up there wasn't anything there. Same thing with MRIs. The complaint is we're spending way too much, too many MRIs in the U.S. Every, every MRI that doesn't detect anything by them is unnecessary and wasted. But how do you know before the fact? You don't. And these things are valuable. And if we make them free, people will consume them a lot more. And the question is how much of it should we subsidize? I don't know the answer. Very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Saving, Professor Rettenmeyer. It's good to have you here in, in Washington, D.C. Now, I'm not going to speak for very long because I'm in Washington, D.C., and my business card with my email address and my phone number is there. And Brian Williams and I are at uh, 601 Pennsylvania Avenue, so we're always here to answer your questions. These two gentlemen are not here very often, so I hope you'll take the opportunity to answer the questions after I'm done. I just want to tell you, take a few minutes to tell you uh, some of the other things we've been doing at the National Center for Policy Analysis Health Policy Research Center and uh, tell you what we plan to do in the future. My slides are not in the handout because they're not as substantive as these gentlemen's slides, uh, but also because I want to ensure that you have uh, an excuse to reach out to me personally as and when you need to. You know, I get up every morning as a health policy specialist and I look at this law that was passed over four years ago. And I say, is there still something to be said about this law? And every morning, the answer is yes. Uh, and that's why we need the kind of research that Professor Saving and Professor Rettenmeyer are doing and that we're going to keep doing at the NCPA Center for Health Policy Analysis. Yesterday, uh, you all saw the two competing decisions on uh, the How Big case, which uh, questions the legitimacy of tax credits paid out to federal exchanges. So eminently qualified judges in the DC circuit and the fourth district circuit came to different conclusions on a question that has huge cash flows tied to it and huge institutional arrangements tied to it. And they still haven't figured it out. So this law is still very much up in the air. And the need for the kind of health policy analysis that we're gonna keep doing is still very much needed. One of the things we do uh, is we have a blog, the NCPA Health Policy Blog. It is the largest traffic blog that, uh, that is on the free market, conservative, libertarian side. Every day we do four substantive articles, either of our own intellectual content or responding in an analytical and substantive way to research that other people have put out, often folks who are supportive of Obamacare. One reason I think we need this kind of independent analysis uh, that we are doing and that Professor Saving and Professor Rettenmeyer are doing is that the government agencies seem increasingly confused about what the outcomes of the Affordable Act are. You might remember back in April, the Congressional Budget Office concluded that in the long term we'd have 2.5 million fewer jobs because of the Affordable Care Act. And then when the media challenged that, the CBO kind of 
walked it back a little. So I thought I should quote what they wrote. Uh, the last sentence here is the reason for the reduction in the supply of labor is that the provisions of the ACA reduce the incentive to work for certain subsets of the population. So uh, maybe some folks uh, think that there's a difference between losing your job, uh, that you don't want to lose it, and some folks that think it's okay to just quit your job because you have something to fall back on, other taxpayers' resources, but I think both are socially pernicious consequences. We also heard earlier this year, uh, and again, this is a quotation from the CBO, can no longer determine exactly how the provisions of the ACA that are not related to the expansion of health insurance coverage have affected their projections of direct spending and revenues. That's why it's so important that we have folks like Dr. Saving and Denton, Dr. Rettenmeyer to come here and do the best they can to tell us what, what the future looks like. Uh, but nobody really knows what the future looks like, including these government agencies. So our conclusion, as you can see from the title, is Obamacare must be reformed, repealed, replaced, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the reform needs a significant reform, and that's what we're here to do. Another problem, you heard the media and the administration cheerlead a little while back that over 8 million people got their uh, signed up in the Obamacare health insurance exchanges, but we also know that income, citizenship, or immigration data for over one quarter of these folks, over two million of them, do not match. And there is no likelihood that they're ever going to match, if you ask me. We're not getting any confidence from any agency of the government that they're figuring out this problem. Uh, one of the things we write about on the blog is we look deeply at Obamacare proponents' analyses of, these, of this law. And we come to different conclusions from the same data that they do. A couple of weeks ago, the Commonwealth Fund had a report out. It was very thorough data. Uh, th these folks know their data. And they uh, concluded that people uh, who had signed up on the Obamacare exchanges were satisfied with their experience. Well, when I read it, the takeaway I got was 57% of the potentially eligible enrollees haven't even visited an exchange. Robert Wood Johnson last week out came out with a, a report, and again, very thorough data, and their conclusion, what they were trying to get at was, you know, are people going to have trouble seeing a doctor, uh, getting treatment, uh, or is the demand going to overwhelm the fixed supply of physicians? And what they found out was that, no, they surveyed doctors of many specialties and said, you know what, we're not seeing any more people now than we used to. But... In states where the Medicaid expansion was expanded, you had about three percentage points more patients coming in who were on Medicaid. Well, if the same number of patients are coming in, but more of them are on Medicaid, all you've done is crowded out privately insured people. So it looks to me from the Robert Wood Johnson study that all they've done is got taxpayer funded patients coming in instead of privately insured patients. But then again, this contradicts earlier research. Uh, sorry, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation research also said uh, the intensity of the patients, i.e. the sickness, the needs of the patients, was no different now than it was in 2013. But we also had earlier data from Express Scripts, which is not an Obamacare apologist, of course, it's a, it's a business, uh, that said the Obamacare patients are using nearly four times more HIV drugs than commercially insured patients. Uh, this is our bias at the NCPA. We think that it is very sick people who have signed up for the exchanges and are getting treated and the costs are going to explode. But we have contradictory information coming out from various sources uh, as to what the consequences of Obamacare are. So that's why we keep blogging four substantive entries a day, uh, looking at the data as they come out and trying to figure out what's going on. Our Health Policy Research Center, uh, there's two of us full time. There's me here in DC, a fellow called Devin Herrick in our Dallas office. And for the forthcoming year or so, we're going to be focusing on four topic areas. One is the role of entrepreneurs. Uh, this includes uh, regulatory burdens on entrepreneurs. It includes our intellectual property system, our patent system. Uh, we're seeing a lot of capital investment in certain areas, digital health, mobile health. Uh, we saw a lot of capital investment in electronic health records, but that was because we threw $30 billion at hospitals and doctor's offices to put in electronic health records, and it doesn't seem like it's had any effect on improving patient care. So we want to ensure the regulatory environment makes sure that entrepreneurship does in healthcare what it does in other sectors, which is increase choice, reduce costs, and increase quality. Second thing that we're going to be looking at is tax reform and health reform. Uh, NCPA, we think a lot of health reform is tax reform. And one of the things we've championed for years is a universal tax credit for every person. Uh, this is something that has huge political headwinds. 
Uh, we haven't figured out how to overcome that, uh, but we're going to keep working on it. We're hoping to have a conference in the beginning of next year when uh, advocates of tax reform can talk about the costs and benefits of all the different versions, you know, the Hatch-Coburn-Burr Act, the 2017 project. What do we do with the exclusion of employer-based tax benefits? Uh, how do we reform that without scaring people about losing their employer-based coverage? Third is entitlement reform, and these are experts in entitlement reform. <laughs> they have studied it for many, many years, and we're going to keep doing that. Fourth is regulatory reform, by which we mean primarily the FDA, uh, which we think net is very harmful uh, to people's access to innovative new medicines and medical technologies. And we think the FDA needs significant reform, not just more user fees paid by the industry. Uh, so again, uh, that's all I'm going to say. There's my contact details. Uh, I'm in DC, so you can talk to me whenever you want. Uh, I've already given some testimony uh, on the risk corridors payment of Obamacare. Uh, that was about a month ago, the end of June. And so I'm available to give testimony on issues. If you think I know what I'm talking about, uh, I encourage you to look at the blog. I think you'll learn a lot, find it useful. Uh, now I'll sit down and I'd, I hope you'll direct your questions at these two gentlemen, uh, because I'm always available and they're going back to Texas today. So. Thank you. Self-insured businesses or uh, universities like yours, the, we're seeing the prices increase at 10% a year. So for a while, self-insured businesses started at about 1,000. What we see recently in the market is three to 400 is about the level. So we're seeing now 56, 58% of employers are self-insuring. Um, that's creating a market. Uh, Third-party administrators are starting to fight down costs and compete for business. Are we seeing that affect the cost curve? One of the issues, you know, waste fraud, our insurance companies, and that's always been involved in, in, in self, of course we self-insure, but that, but actually to the people at the university, they think it's Blue Cross Blue Shield, but it's really not, it's us. And, uh, you know, if, and, and the premiums are the average of what we're spending per person. That's how it works. I mean, that's what that's what making costs go up, and the more things that we require, as I pointed out about uh, about these wellness tests, the more th things that you require people to do that aren't productive, the more our our premiums have to rise because we have to pay the average of what we're spending. That's and not not from any other price. I mean, because we're self-insured. But the same thing is true of even private insurance companies. They, they, the premiums have to cover what the people are actually consuming. And, all, and insurance premiums rising all has to do with consumption, and, and we can already see a lot of that. The more things you make free, the more it's going to cost everybody else. And that doesn't mean it's bad to make them free. We might have been willing to pay for it, but, I mean, to understand that that's where, the, that's where it's coming from. If that's, if that's relevant to, to the question... I generally agree with you on that point, but in this market, I, things actually seem to be changing a little bit. So uh, there's surgeons that, or there's uh, third-party administrators, Blue Cross Blue Shields not doing it, the entrepreneurs in the market are doing it, make surgeries free at certain centers, and that seems to be reducing the cost. So that's, I guess that, that was my fight as well. Oh, right, exactly. Well, there's no doubt that, uh, that if you get a group of people who are willing to have uh, restrictions on what, where they can go, and as we know in the, in the whole idea when, <clears throat> when Peter Orzak was saying, if everybody could just be like the Mayo Clinic, as efficient and as good as the Mayo Clinic, look what health care would be like. <laughs> and if you have, of course, the Mayo Clinic had a particular, and Cleveland Clinic, two places, that a very significant part of their business was cash business from Canada. And because of that, they had to actually have real prices instead of fictitious prices. Because if you're coming from Canada to the Mayo, you have to know what it's going to cost you. And the, uh, so that you've got, they weren't really the good, but if we could all be like you, people who live in Utah. But again, the innovators are coming in, and I think it, opening up the road for these people to innovate, just like the concierge docs or, or the, that kind of group of people who are coming in and having new innovations, who can find the place, shop for you the way someone goes to Expedia to get a hotel room. You can do that on the web to get knee surgery. And if you're going to do it, 
And if you're in a system where that's actually going to benefit you, we're going to see a lot of that, I hope. And I would like, if, if the Affordable Care Act prevents that from happening, those are the things we need to change about it to allow it to happen. That, those, are, those are important things. And, it, and maybe, it will, maybe the competition among the, the way it's going to treat these state uh, groups that come in, the private groups, when you can't get into one of the other ones, may actually change things. May, we're hoping that what would have, what possible is to happen is what happened when we did the uh, Medicare Expansion Act, of uh, the, the Drug Act. Uh, you know, as trustees, we, we way overestimated what that was going to cost because we underestimated the impact of competition for these in policies that people were going to buy way overestimated that impact. We, Even though I'm a big competition person, and would say the competition would make things better, I underestimated it. And every each year, we way overestimated, even though it dropped rapidly as to what was really happening. And this could happen in with exchanges with uh, the people who go into the private sector who can't get in the exchange, and that competition may actually have this this positive effect. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much.